I heard this huge explosion. It sounded like a bomb. It's just loud. I mean, it sounded deafening. Sudden explosion, a plantation shopping center blown apart, devastating results. What was the cause? We are going to ask the plantation deputy fire chief. He's with us live. My name is Scott Israel. I want to file to run for sheriff. He is running again. The sheriff suspended under fire for two mass shootings, wants voters to do what the governor and the courts would not. Scott Israel is right here with us live. I want to tell the state attorney, thank you for doing the right decision, making the right decision. Crime and punishment. Three BSO deputies are charged for the tough takedown of a teen, but then that teen gets rearrested. That's just one of the topics we will take to the roundtable. Good Sunday morning. Great to be with you. A packed hour ahead, and we begin with developments and questions about the devastating explosion at a plantation shopping center. It looked like a bomb had been dropped on the market at university, and now all eyes are on what caused that blast. The sudden explosion 24 hours ago blew down a former pizza restaurant at the market on university, and its shattered windows did a lot of damage to a nearby LA fitness gym, and in frightened people, they came running out of that gym and the shopping center running for their lives. People in the parking lot had to take cover from falling debris. A total of 23 people were hurt, including one child. What happened is the question now, and the first question we pose to Plantation Fire Deputy Chief Joel Gordon, who is right here with us. Chief, good morning. Good Great morning. to have Chief, you. You've great been to out have you 24 here. hours. Thank, thank you for right having us. Right out there. Yeah. What, oh, yeah. what happened? Well, do we know? Uh, uh, what we know so far is there was some kind of a blast, some kind of an explosion. Uh, and obviously, you know, as you see from, from so much video and so many photos, uh, debris was scattered over quite a large area. Right. Like you said, 23 people injured. The good news is uh, of those 23 people, all but two have been released from the hospital uh, and the other two are just being watched at this point. So we really, really dodged the bullet. It was somewhat miraculous that nobody died in this blast, which was just huge and powerful. I mean, look at these, the video that we are showing, we showed all yesterday afternoon and again uh, this morning. So, but this went out as a natural gas explosion initially, but you have not been able to confirm that yet. We have not. And the reason we're not confirming it is because there are so many factors that could go into what causes an explosion that to just get focused on one area, the, the, since the investigation only started this morning, yeah. so they have to dig through the rubble and really find the source first. So we don't want to commit to something that may not be true. While not committing to anything, and we are very clear nothing is confirmed, you have people asking now, Saturday morning in a suburban shopping center, there but for the grace of God go anybody. How do you tell now a skittish public that this is not going to happen again? Has it happened recently nearby? What is, what should people know about potential gas explosions like we think this is? Right. The most important thing to understand is gas explosions like this are extremely rare. They're very rare. The circumstances have to really co come together in just the right mixture, literally. Um, and there's, there's warning signs. There's plenty of early warning signs. The biggest one is the odor. There's a chemical put into the, into the gas, because the gas itself is colorless and odorless, but mm -hmm. there's a chemical put in there that make, it smells bad and it actually makes you sick. Yeah. And the purpose of that is to warn you that there is gas. Has anyone Which, smelled gas? I, it's unknown yeah. at this time if anybody had reported a gas yeah. smell. We, we did have, uh, it was reported yesterday that we had one earlier, but that was, that was a half a mile away and a whole nother All right, well, facility. I was going to say there was a tweet that was sent out maybe by your department right. July 3rd saying there is an odor of gas, but that was not at this site. No, that was a completely different area. Half a mile away, you said? Yes. Might it have been on the same gas line? the same grid? That's that's tough to tell. Yeah. I wouldn't be able yeah. to tell that. Uh, Chief, this um, Pizza Fire restaurant, which was the epicenter of the explosion, um, it was undergoing renovations. I mean, had city uh, building inspectors been in there? I, I mean, you've got to be looking, you and the state fire marshal clearly are looking at that because the worst part of the damage happened right there in the back of that building. Yeah, it's, it, it's going to be pretty significant that that's where it occurred from. Um, the, the state fire marshal's going in, our, inv our in investigators are going to be in there as well. 
Um, as far as the, the occupancy itself, uh, we're going to have to pull the records from the building department on you know, wh when was it vacated, what's been going mm -hmm. on there, and, and there'll be records of all of that sure. that in the coming days we'll be able to pull on. Right. The gas company, Tico People's Gas, we have a, a representative who is with you here mm -hmm. in the studio. There was some information put out by the company that there have been checks, there have been no leaks, there was not a problem anyone suspected beforehand, yet yesterday you talked of finding ruptured gas lines. Do you know whether those ruptures were the cause of the blast or might have contributed to them? Well, th this is the reason we're hesitant to project a cause because from the amount of damage that's there, the ga ruptured gas lines could very well be secondary to the explosion. And that's what has to be determined during the investigation. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I, let me just say, as someone who was watching local 10 News cover this, saw you out there, I thought you were poised and, and had good information, but you. you were men and women and the police uh, in plantation and adjoining agencies. Mm -hmm. I've got to say, I thought the first responders really did excellent work so thanks and congratulations Th thank you so much and it really was a tribute to the the mutual aid system we have in Broward County uh, we had almost every agency there and everybody cooperated and everybody really really did well together um, and really stepped up to the plate and, and this was I, I being one of the first ones on scene this was very chaotic it was very confusing sure, they always are even to orient to where we were at the mm -hmm. time and to have everybody coming in and pitching in and saying we'll we'll help with this we'll help with that really made it work well, and I think that was part of the positive outcome. Excellent. Chief, I'm, I'm gonna ask you something that I'm guessing, because it's a weekend, you, you probably don't know yet, but I'm sure you're gonna be looking into code inspections and reports from not only that pizza restaurant, but from that shopping center at large. Do, you, do we know anything yet about the history of reports, if there are any code infractions that might have played into something like this? Well, the, the building inspector um, was on scene yesterday. He's there today as well. Uh, they'll have all those records and they'll be able to go through them and, and look and see if there's any kind of a history. We do know the mall was recently renovated. Uh, the, the property manager was also on scene, so they as well will have yeah. history on what was done and how yeah. it was done. But that's going to take days yeah. to go all through. Right. Battalion yeah. Chief Joel Gordon, good work. Thank you for coming in. We really appreciate My the pleasure. live update here on Sunday morning. Thanks My pleasure. Very much. Yeah, Thank thanks. you. Thank all you. right. Up next, former Broward Sheriff Scott Israel. He is now officially running again. Does Scott Israel deserve to be reelected? You'll hear from him right here, live next. Welcome back. He said he would, and he did. Suspended Broward Sheriff uh, Scott Israel filed for re-election this week to ask voters to do what the governor and the courts have not. Governor Ron DeSantis suspended Scott Israel in January for incompetence and neglect of duty. Israel vehemently rejects those uh, accusations. The governor appointed Gregory Tony to be the Broward Sheriff. He has told us he does intend to run next year to keep that job. Scott Israel was elected Broward Sheriff in 2012, re-elected in 2016. He calls his suspension politically motivated by the governor, and he fought it in the courts where he lost and before the state Senate where it is still pending. Last month, Israel took the stand to appeal for reinstatement by the state Senate, and that decision likely by September, and it is by all accounts considered a long shot. And here is Sheriff Israel. Sheriff, good morning. We're good glad you're here. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. All right. Good morning. So you, you sought in the courts to get your job back. You did not win there. You've asked the state Senate to give you your job back. It doesn't really, frankly, look very likely given a Republican-controlled Senate. Now you're asking the voters of Broward County to put you back in the job. Why should they? Because of my past performance, um, we've kept Broward County safer. We've reduced violent crime. We've distributed over four million pounds of food to people who, who are needy. We've connected with all our communities. I've been a visible sheriff. Um, and I think that the community understands that. And uh, we're going to see what happens in the election next year. And I feel very confident we'll win and we'll be put back in place. You, uh, you had filed those papers on Monday, but just a few weeks before that, we were in Tallahassee at your hearing as you, we had seen some video of you on the stand 
testifying as to all of those things that you just started talking about, why you should have your job back and all of the things, the positive things that you've done as sheriff, but really your suspension was focused on two really big, horrific events that the governor cited in your suspension, and that was the shootings at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and then before that at Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport. And Governor DeSantis, in the days after you testified, told us, he heard during your testimony for the first time you took responsibility for what happened those days. Did he read that right? No. I've always taken responsibility for the actions and inactions of every member of the Broward Sheriff's Office, civilian sworn fire, as any leader would. But responsibility doesn't mean you could control the actions of 6,000 people any more than I could control the actions of a horrific killer. We made changes. I brought in a real-time crime center. I took a leader from New York City uh, and brought him down. I spoke with the school superintendent, Ms. Mr. Runcie, and now BSO has the ability to access cameras immediately without permission. What the governor did was completely political. That, um, I don't mean to interrupt you, but that was <coughs> after the shootings, not that, before, right? That was, that, was that was after the shooting. But to think about this, I'm a 40-year veteran in law enforcement and the governor's attorney calls me incompetent and negligent and couldn't even bring one witness. Not one person came up to testify. Although the, the documents, and to, to your point, there was no one testifying against you, but the testimony really, Mr. Israel, wasn't it in the documents? There, there was a whole list of reasons why the governor gave to suspend you, and, and among those reasons were the signs that had gone un, uh, unattended to, that the shooter could or would do something like this, tips to BSO that never went anywhere. Uh, they cited active shooter training that maybe wasn't up to par. So despite the fact that there was nobody on the stand testifying against you, there was facts and testimony and evidence entered into why the governor thought that your actions or inactions rose to that level. That was completely a false narrative. Look in your very own website. You have the report from the uh, Broward Sheriff's Internal Affairs Division. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement went out and they arrested Scott Peterson and they called our policies, our procedures, and our training industry standard training. Our deputies were trained. The policies and procedures were vetted. We were an accredited agency, and this was just a false narrative that was politically yeah, motivated. He made this decision in, ja in, in March, one month after Stoneman Douglas, before he read any report, yeah. while a sitting Republican governor never chose to do anything. Yeah. Uh, Sheriff, I mean, look, let's be kind of brutally frank here. You are politically swimming against the tide and against the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Safety Commission report, which halted command failures at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, the failures of almost every BSO deputy who first arrived at the scene just this past week, two more of those deputies who failed to active and fired, all those people were hired under your leadership. Don't you bear responsibility for that? I don't think any of them were hired under my leadership. I think they all came onto the agency before I was sheriff, so that's misinformation you have. Okay. Uh, I inherited many of the people. Scott Peterson became a deputy in 1992. Um, as I said, to quote Scott Peterson, he received the training, he knew what to do, he just doesn't know why he didn't do it. And let me say this, Peterson not going in, and if others didn't do what they were supposed to do, Michael, I've been a cop 40 years, it wasn't a training issue, and it wasn't a policy issue, it was about courage and you can't control the human element. And yeah. if any one of us knew how to identify yeah. what a person's going to do, how they would do it, we shouldn't be sitting here. We should be a billionaire making money, explaining to people how they could well, predict how a person you know, would I perform. I grant you this. It's easy here, <clears throat> after the fact, to look at this dispassionately and say, this should have happened, that should have happened. But police officers, after Columbine, the consensus of all police agencies was, when there is an active shooter situation, you've got to go in, and your people did not go in. We had uh, Deputy Peterson did not go in, and immediately I took responsibility for that. I suspended him without pay immediately. 
we work to. But you had the sergeant, I'm, I'm sorry, I forget his name, the sergeant who arrived, it took many couple of minutes putting on his vest, then he drove to an exterior position. This is one of the deputies who was just fired in the last week. It just wasn't Scott Peterson. There, I mean, it was Coral Springs police who first went into the school. It was not BSO. That's incorrect as well. We went in with the Coral Springs Police Department. Right. Uh, we went. In, we went in together. There were. There, there was a big. You know, nobody talks about the the incredible communication lapse. We were on a different radio system from from Coral Springs, and you know that, Michael. I do. Coral Springs yeah. was receiving different information from us. They were receiving information from a dispatch system. We were receiving information from Scott Peterson, and and you know that that led to the. Uh, to the errors that, or, or the misinformation. Um, but at the end of the day, people want to talk, Glenna, about the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Commission report. I do too. The report never speaks about removing me. It never talks about incompetence or misfeasance. As a matter of fact, the chairman of well, the report Sheriff went on national did TV not recommend that and, you be suspended. and he did not recommend I'd be, I'd be yeah. suspended. No, this go, should be left to the people. Let, let's go back um, to the issue about going in. The, much has been said, and please do talk to us about the directive that you had changed under your watch to your deputies during active shooter situations from uh, you shall go in the change to you may go in, which was done, but then changed back again. Talk to us about those changes. Uh, we changed it, I changed it to from May to, sh uh, from uh, shall to may. Um, let, me, let me back up. This is a red herring. That, that may or shall is absolutely the same. Whenever you have may, you're given, you're saying to your deputies, we have officer discretion. We have the ability to think on our feet. I mean, I was a SWAT commander. But, but go back and, so why did you make those changes? If, if it's a red herring, uh, what, what would the change matter? We changed it to May to give out, to let our deputies know you have discretion. We don't want you entering in to a booby trap door, even though that might be the quickest route to the killer if you know you're gonna die. A dead deputy, a dead police officer can't help anybody. Look at that hero that died out in Thousand Oaks who went right through the door. Mm -hmm. We want you through the door. We want you to push. We want you to take the person into custody or make him give up or kill the killer. But then why change it back? I was asked to by Sheriff Gualtieri. Uh, he just said they wanted it to be more uniform. But I ask you to do this, a little homework assignment. Look at all the policies in the state. So many of them around the state, around the country say may. We have an industry standard policy, and I have not read a policy. Michael, I have not read a policy that uses the word shall, that doesn't have a caveat, say, yeah. but unreasonable. Every policy out there allows yeah. for deputy discretion, as, as they should. And with Peterson, it wasn't a policy All issue. Right. Well, it goes well beyond Scott Peterson. It began him with him, but it, it, it sort of ended with you. I mean, the buck stops with the sheriff. You're saying... I accept that buck, it's on my desk. I mean, it is your responsibility. I accept the responsibility of the actions and inactions of all the deputies to make changes, uh, to discipline, to hold people accountable. But you cannot control the actions of 6,000 people. And Broward yeah, County knows it. that. Well, let's take a quick break. We will come back and we will have more with suspended Broward Sheriff Scott Israel right after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back on this Sunday. We are live with former Broward Sheriff uh, Scott Israel. Sheriff Israel, uh, Gregory Tony, appointed to be the sheriff in January by the governor, says that active shooting for BSO was inadequate, insufficient, below standards, and he has really stepped up active shooter training. Was it deficient under you? Absolutely not. I guess he's running for office, so what's he supposed to say? I've been disappointed by a few of the remarks he's made, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, that'll come out campaign time. But the training was industry standard training, and it was what it needed to be. Our deputies knew what they needed to do, whether or not they did it or not. You, you know yeah. what I learned during, we learned during the hearing was that what I didn't know is that there is no standard or no mandate for active shooting training in the state of Florida, and, and still is not. And, and still is not. The governor has done nothing about that, and under, he understands that as well. And, you know, you guys have a lot of people in the legal profession on this show, so I think, you'll, I think you'll understand when I say this. 
if my suspension, if my hearing in Tallahassee, uh, Glenna, was a trial, the judge would direct a verdict of acquittal. There's just nothing there to call to call words like mean words like incompetent or negligent. It's it's just it's just sad let, and let, inaccurate. Let, let me ask you something that happened this week. The Commission for Law Enforcement Accreditation decided unanimously, a 13-member panel, not to renew the accreditation of the Broward Sheriff's Office, which was very disheartening for the men and women who work there right now. But but cited many of the same reasons because of those two mass shootings that happened under your watch. Does that somehow lend credence to the charges that the governor made? Just the opposite. As you said, they used a lot of the same uh, uh, wording and verbiage. They used exactly the same word, wording and verbiage. It was a mockery of Broward County. Um, professional accreditors, as they always do, came down in December of last year and gave us glowing recommendations. They came back in March and gave us glowing recommendations. And then a commission that I understand is saturated with another party went ahead and overruled that. I don't know that that's ever been so done before. So this was political <clears throat> too? Oh, absolutely. Uh, they overruled it. That's never been done before. And they use the same reason. First of all, I think the, the mission statement of the commission is to talk about policies, procedures, and protocols. And they were all in place. The commission said that deputies did not perform in alliance with those policies and procedures. That's a job for internal affairs and training and the leaders. That's not a job for a commission. Uh, you know, the commission used, it almost sounded like the governor's attorney. And they said that both shootings. Let me say this to the Broward County public for once and for all. I owe this to the men and women who work federally, state, locally, taxi cab drivers, bus drivers, uh, paramedics, the airport shooting. I understand, Glenna, that five people lost their lives. I understand, Michael, that five others were shot. But from the time Jesse Madrigal came and took that killer into custody mm -hmm. and prevented the loss of more lives, the performance of law enforcement and BSO was exemplary. Yeah. We were right, organized well, and we were prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Sheriff, I, I, I have to, excuse me, Glenna, I have mm -hmm. to ask this question uh, because one of the, the lessons of the failures, even though Deputy Madrigal did a great job and that shooter was down within 90 seconds, I guess, of the shooting, um, the fact is the radio system for BSO uh, failed at the airport. Uh, I was on the air that day. You could see it was just totally chaotic. Commanders couldn't speak to deputies. And then the same thing happened basically at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. My question is, why didn't you, after the airport shooting, go to the Broward County Commission and say, look, yeah, I'm a constitutionally elected official and I, you know, you aren't really running the department I am, but we've got this terrible, intense emergency with communications within Broward County and you've got to give us the money to build the system you know that will work and you didn't do that after the airport they didn't fund the money and then you had Stoneman Douglas and the radio system failed again. Michael you know that that was completely a county responsibility they own the radio system that would be like me telling you to fix your house this is something they owned this the our county commissioners and our county administrator were well aware of the problems. They all working to solve mm -hmm. the problems. They all working with Motorola. Uh, I, I represented the issues that we had, as did other fire chiefs. There are other fire chiefs and yeah. police chiefs. We're just one user of the system. But you're the, the major, I mean, you've got 6,000 people, had 6,000 people who work for you. It is the principal law enforcement and fire agency in Broward County. Michael, we asked for the money. We asked for the system to be corrected. The county administrator and the county are working diligently on that. Well, now Where they're, they are, they're doing have, it. Well, you'd have to ask them, but to, to, to say that I could control nine county commissioners, nine yeah. elected officials, and a county administrator who have a finite budget I'm, and I'm know what saying, they want to spend, I Sheriff, can't control Sheriff, I'm not that. saying you can control it. You could have made it a cause celeb. You could have gone to the court of public opinion and said, look, 
they're not listening to me. You put your pressure on the mayor and the commission, the administrator, let's get the radio system fixed. Michael, you and Broward County citizen know I did everything I could and it was something outside of my control. I made it known, the county understood that, yeah. and the county's dealing with it. That's like, again, that's like me telling you how to fix your house. I have no control over the budget and no control over those decisions. These are nine other elected officials. Right. They need to be brought on the show and they need to be asked about it, not me, about why another group of people didn't do what they should have done or could have done. Scott Israel, we appreciate you coming in. Now that you're a candidate, uh, just for the record, we will give equal time to the people running against you. And one of those people, I understand, is going to be the current sheriff, Gregory Tony. I look forward to it. Uh, great to have you here. It's always and, great to uh, be here. And before the primary, we're going to invite you back to sit with uh, Gregory Tony or any other legitimate candidate and have a good, robust debate. I relish the opportunity. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Up next, we take all this week's hot topics right to the round table. Stay tuned. We have so much to talk about this morning, this week, with our roundtable, so let's get right to it. Ah, first an all-star group today, so some introductions first. Rosemary O'Hara is the editorial page editor of the Sun Sentinel. Chris Smith is an attorney in Fort Lauderdale and a former state senator from Broward. Mari Lee Cancio is an attorney in Miami and an important voice in the Florida Republican Party. This week she was appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis to the newly created Greater Miami Expressway Agency. The, the toll woman, or anti-toll woman now. That's it. <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all need to talk. <laughs> all right, so good morning, or good afternoon by this point. I'm glad you're all here. Rosemary, let me begin by asking you here, BSO lost its state accreditation this week. It really won't change the way services are delivered by the BSO deputies or the fire department, but it is the latest in a string of black eyes that this department has gotten. Uh, yes, it is. It, it casts a cloud over the agency, and that's unfortunate. It does, though, when you have a system of an elected county sheriff cast a political card on the table. The decertification seemed to be aimed at former Sheriff Israel right. and perhaps politically calculated to help Sheriff Tony because if he then is able to get the agency reaccredited in right. a few months, he will get the credit for that. It also could help the governor's case in the Senate um, that he was justified mm -hmm. in uh, suspending Sheriff Israel for the airport and the Parkland shootings. You, right. you know what's what's confusing is, as uh, Scott Israel had mentioned, and I have the documents, he is telling the truth, that there were two on-site assessments that this agency gave glowing reports prior to delisting. That's, that's confusing. And it, to the point that I saw, so I heard about this decertification a week before it was even announced. And so when I heard about it, I started researching it a little bit. And then when it became public was the day he filed for re-election. Right. So that kind of, you know, put my... Actually, it bubbled to the surface over the weekend. We all started hearing about it over right. the weekend. And as as But it was works, done the no week before. To, yes, it, it was, was done the week before. No one could report it without any kind of confirmation. Right. So but, it was done the week before. But I think yeah. we all have to agree that the sheriff's office has problems they had. Yes training problems, equipment problems, communication problems, and mm -hmm. they even withdrew from seeking national certification in January. Mm -hmm. So it shows that they probably felt that they were not prepared. I mean, Sheriff Tony also is going to have tremendous challenges in the last six months. We've seen a lot of negative news even mm -hmm. during his leadership. Yeah. So I think that they need to regroup. There well, are other certifications already. But they are, I think, under Sheriff Tony, they are regrouping. Uh, Chris, let me ask you this mm -hmm. week, uh, two of the deputies who were seen on that viral video, cell phone video, showing a 15-year-old DeLuca Roll yes. being pepper sprayed, taken to the ground, punched in Person. the head. Uh, they were charged by Mike Satz, the Brown State Attorney this week, with battery and also falsifying a police report, lying on the police report, and a third deputy who was on the scene 
who had written sort of a an account supporting them, he was charged as well. What does it, that tell you? That was a tremendous step forward for Mike Satz and the Broward State's attorney to go ahead and file those charges. We were a little disappointed that they're misdemeanor charges. All those, even that battery is a mm -hmm. misdemeanor battery. Um, and when you look at how violently and gratuitously this kid's face was pushed into the ground, to be charged with a misdemeanor battery, even if you, you know, you plead it down later, but the original charge being a misdemeanor was a little disheartening. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to thank and be glad that for once in Broward that these officers were charged and it will send a signal throughout the law enforcement community that maybe we need to rethink these type of situations when it comes to kids in Broward County. You know, they are the latest in a recent string of officers in both mm -hmm. Broward and Dade being criminally charged for use of force. But Rosemary, use of force charges, that, that's a whole subject. But lying goes to character. Right. Lie, that, that is a troubling charge for mm -hmm. a police officer. The cover up is worse than the crime kind of charge. Right. And it, it goes to show why body cameras are so helpful, both to protect an officer who's wrongly mm -hmm. accused and to uh, protect the public who may be uh, wrongly abused. As in there, I mean, another uh, uh, charges filed this week were against the officicer who who just punched in the face, that guy who was handcuffed mm -hmm. to a hospital bed. bed mm -hmm. You know, so, so and, and going back to Sheriff Israel, I would say that part of the politics of this state accreditation board is um, the Sheriff Israel was an outlier in the sheriff's group. He was stood against open carry, campus carry, four body cameras, against assault weapons, and for a number of people, um, and that went against the, the standings of the state sheriff's group. So he was an outlier in that group. Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not standing up for him. I'm just saying that there's politics going on here that we need to recognize. You know, uh, Miami-Dade County is the only county right now that does not elect a sheriff. That's about to change now. It's going to change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's going to change. Does that, I believe it was Rosemary who mentioned politics in law enforcement poses some troubling issues. I agree. I agree. I mean, I wish that all those positions were uh, nonpartisan, nonpolitical. Yeah, well, we should point out to anybody who isn't aware, maybe you better than I, but mm -hmm. the uh, Constitutional Revision Commission put that on the ballot. One of the changes was that you had to elect a county sheriff. Yeah. Miami Dade County hasn't had an elective sheriff since, I don't know, 1948 when there was corruption and it was a, just a terrible police department. For Since that time, the Broward, the Miami Dade County Sheriff, police chief, has reported to the mayor and it's worked just fine, but now 2022. Oh, well, I know Not only that, but also an elections chair who is going to be up for yeah. property well, appraiser. Right. And come on, when you talk, when you talk law raiser. enforcement, now let's just look at Miami Dade County. We had an officer this week not get any jail time for shooting at an autistic guy holding a train and missing that autistic guy and hitting the guy next to him and get no jail time. He, he, I mean, so let's not think that just because it's an appointed down there. I mean, there's always problems in law enforcement. Well, that, that's, a, that's a judge and jury issue, right. the right. sentencing. Yeah. I mean, the, the, yeah. the conviction was there. That was the sentencing. And I mean, while we're on this, can I just go rogue <laughs> for a little bit? The, uh, the judge in this case not only issued no jail time as part of the sentence, but also is making uh, Officer Alayda write an essay. 2,500 words essay. Stand at the board and write, you know, so I will not shoot, you know, a <laughs> caregiver line on the street. I got my 12 year old now, like, Dad. Is this a Can I write essays <laughs> now? Hey, hey, if we're going to go rogue, remember the judge that didn't want to sentence uh, the kid for rape because he was a good boy from a good family going to a good yeah. college. Oh, that's I think a whole other I mean, subject. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that is a whole other subject. But that, I mean, is that an appropriate. For, for Jonathan Aleda, that was a case okay. where he said he wasn't aiming properly. So, you either missed or you had a use of force issue. But even if and you were aiming properly, was, you were shooting at an autistic kid holding a train yeah. when there were other officers there. So what's your take You're on that? You're the only one that shot. You're there? the only one that shot. There are other officers there, so that shows me that there's a problem with this officer, that he was the only one to actually shoot. And so now 
with him not serving jail time and stuff, I don't know if he keeps his accreditation well, he was found, or can serve as a he as was an officer found guilty of culpable negligence. It's not as if the jury they found right. against him. But can he serve on as an charge. officer? Some, can he go to another department or something? I, I don't know the answer That's to a that. Good question. Good, good I mean, because I got concerns. Let's with ask that. our we'll find that out. I know someone's crack tweet producer us the answer. to check that when we come back <laughs> with more roundtable. Stay with us in just a minute. Welcome back. We are in the midst of an excellent roundtable with Mary Lee Cancio, Chris Smith, and Rosemary O'Hara. Rosemary, you were saying during the break that you had seen some early polling, even though this far out, who knows what it means. But Scott Israel is the favorite up there to be reelected? Yes. I actually haven't seen it, but I've heard about it. And I've been told that the polling shows that Scott Israel is the front runner um, in the Broward Sheriff's race, that it is his race to lose that for a lot of people, um, they see his suspension as Trump's favorite governor having suspended Sheriff Israel hmm. for going on television and standing up to the NRA. So hmm. for some context, whose polling is that? Do you know, you know the background of the poll? No, I don't. I don't. All right. Well, we will look, for, but that's yeah. fascinating. I mean, Broward County is the most democratic county in the, in the state. And Gregory Tony, the very nice and I, I mm -hmm. like the guy, the the new sheriff used to be a Republican. He changed his registration to Democrat shortly after he took office. Well, and you a got a couple it, days before. He yeah, took you got it. a Democratic county that's had a sheriff appointed by a Republican governor, and so sometimes the voters just want, hey. Is our decision to make, not the not, not Tallahassee's well, decision. Gregory Tony is the public servant in place. He right. is now a Democrat. Has said he is going to be running in the primary against Scott Israel and a couple of more people. So, you know, Scott Israel has name recognition, no doubt. Is it is it too early to place your faith in a poll like that? Well, absolutely, it's too early. <laughs> yeah. And let's let's hope that. What a shocking sure. answer. <laughs> <laughs> Marley, let's yeah. uh, let's pivot a little bit here. I want you to get comment on the fact that uh, late this week, President Trump said that he still wants to get the citizenship question on the census, even though the census questionnaire is being printed without it. The Supreme Court said uh, in response to the request to put it on the questionnaire that the reasons given by the Commerce Department were contrived. Now, what's the president doing here? Well, you know, that question was uh on the census ballot for many, many decades. So it's not something that is the first time that it would be in there. Right, it's been and 70 it, years uh, since it's been on well, a census, but. Well, no, they, they had it in the long format until like maybe 20 years ago. So I think that we need uh, to know like how many people do we have here illegally? How, we talk about 11 million, 14 million. I mean, I would like to know. It would help them. It would help our immigration the, the debate. The difference now is, from as compared to 20 years ago, we now have a public debate of we're going to start going and grabbing people and deporting them. So now there's a heightened sense of, of awareness about it as compared to 20 years ago. Well, I mean, no, we're, we're actually going to enforce the laws and the oh. people that are about to be yes. uh, the porter, the people that already went through the system, about 2 million people that already went through our court systems that have found that they already had their due process, they in court, and now it's time to leave because what we're seeing right now with the immigration crisis, that what we're seeing in the southern border, it's a real crisis in our country and something I, that... I don't think any reasonable person would dispute that there is a crisis. Yes. Um, Rosemary, I've, I've got to say I'm certainly no expert on the Constitution of the Census, but as I understand it, it simply says every 10 years you will count everybody in this country. It doesn't say citizens, mm -hmm. non-citizens, and we know for a fact that a lot of uh, uh, people who even have green cards or who became citizens or live here legally are frightened to put their status down or talk to a census taker. Right, it says persons. It doesn't say citizens. Mm -hmm. We were gonna count the number of persons. And um, and Justice Chief Justice Roberts um, sided with the more liberal uh, majority or minority of the Supreme Court in saying that the, the federal, the president's arguments for putting the question on, on the census didn't hold water. 
and that the the basis really stemmed from this political calculation that putting that question will keep mostly Hispanics who are not citizens from being counted and that will largely affect democratic districts. Is well, the census mm -hmm. is to count the number yeah. of people in return for providing representation in Congress. But That's more, part of it. And services and funding. Yes. So wouldn't South Florida of of all places yes. really lose out if those numbers yeah. are And that's right. why I say it's not just Democratic districts. It's the state of Florida yeah. as a whole. I mean, when you talk about the number of people that we have here in South Florida and in Central Florida and in um, the Tampa area, I mean, to lose counts on those, we'll lose federal yeah. dollars coming down Huge to the state. Huge amounts of money. We'll lose apportionment um, in, yeah. in the yeah. but, U.S. But, Congress. But the, but the narrative is that you, we're going to lose numbers because people are not going to want to answer. The yes. census already has questions and saying, who do, who's your partner? Who do you live with? What's your date of birth? So it already includes a lot of very uh, qu questions that you would say, well, maybe they don't want to answer these yeah, questions. But the citizenship question, I think, is, is different of different kind. You know, before we run out of time, uh, I do want to just give a chance f to play a little bit of the soundbite of the president on July 4th. He gave generally a kind of a pro-military, praising the military speech at the Lincoln Memorial, good for that. You know, nobody could really object too strongly. But there was one part of his speech that just was sort of off the rails. Here it is. In June of 1775, the Continental Congress created a unified army out of the revolutionary forces. It ran the ramparts. It took over the airports. <laughs> <laughs> Which airports were those? <laughs> you know, he said he said the teleprompter broke yeah. down, which is why he said it. But uh, uh, as somebody who has lived with teleprompter for many years, mm -hmm. you know, when the teleprompter breaks down and I say something, you know, in error, mm -hmm. I would like to think that I maybe stop and say, "Oh, wait a minute, that's not right." You know, well, I'm going to correct my. For the first part, for the first time, the, the president did say that he was wrong, which I was shocked. He was like, the "Teleprompter went off and." Yeah, I was wrong on but this. But he said he knew the speech cold. He, yeah, you know, well, he didn't I mean, need the teleprompter. <laughs> and all the criticisms we've heard in the past for politicians <laughs> using teleprompters, you know, and then when President Trump's teleprompter goes down, he makes what these memes, the the battle of baggage claim. I, I think I think that you can pick on that uh, mistake that he made, but I think this salute mm. to America was. He made unifying remarks. He honored the military. Yeah. I think it was a beautiful day, a great patriotic day yeah. to celebrate yeah, I, America. I, I still have to say, um, <laughs> to see tanks on the mall in front of the Lincoln Memorial, uh, it just doesn't sit well with me. The, the bar is so low because he didn't go political. You know, we have to applaud or whatever. Come okay. on, I think we just, it's all that. good that we can all laugh at ourselves every once in a while. Yeah, I've and never made any bets. I mean, yeah. all right. I don't, I don't thank, thank you all for Jeez. coming in. Rosemary, actually, a little under the weather. Thanks for being a trooper and showing up. Thanks, all. We'll be back with a check of the Sunday forecast. Do not go away. Happy Sunday. Take this live look now from tower cams across South Florida. And here is weather authority meteorologist Brandon Orr with the official Sunday forecast. Hey, Brandon. Hey guys, already heating up nicely, just touching 90 degrees, and that's bubbling up some showers and thunderstorms. Inland spots of Broward County at least, so heads up towards Weston, over towards Sunrise. You have some showers moving out of Pembroke Pines. We have some over towards Miami-Dade, and certainly some strong ones as you're headed down towards Key West. So high temperature, we're at it right now, 90 degrees. We have more rain on the way the next few days, and then we crank up the heat up to 93 at the end of that seven day. In other words, no surprises. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. You can catch any of our shows right here on local10.com, and you can also subscribe right there on the web to our This Week in South Florida Roundtable podcast online. And as always, remember, stay informed, get involved. And stay Have tuned. a great Sunday. SoFlo Health is next right here.